Hey everyone, welcome back to our Mythic Table Warcast. This is Kenny Viato from Mythico Studios, here joined with uh, Sean Naden, Kirk Klaus, and TJ Lanigan. Uh, we got some awesome topics for you guys today, and keeping to the trend for our fourth episode of kind of new players in the mix of Warhammer 40k, we're going to go over some tournament etiquette today. You know, uh, you know, for the newer players out there trying to get into those tournaments, just like we were talking in our past podcast, you want to make sure that you guys know what you know, you should expect for tournament etiquette and player rules of conduct. Uh, most of the tournaments you'll be going to uh, usually have an ITC standard, which you can find on to the Frontline uh, Gaming um, website. They have like a player rules of conduct and, you know, pretty much in there shows you how to do like how to take care of tournament etiquette. But, you know, there's some couple of questions we want to get answered for a bunch of new players today. And, you know, let's hop right into it. So as a new player going into pretty much any tournament around the area or around the nation, you know, expecting to play in an ITC event. What do you guys think uh, they should be expected to see for tournament etiquette? You know, how should they hold themselves? I know we covered a little bit about this with, like, um, in the previous podcast about players not being a dick to other players, pretty much, um, and to really specify that, like, they're a new player. Yeah, I mean, that's the basis of it right the game is a social game so there's always there's a social contract when you come to the table whether you're playing in a small community tournament a large tournament to not be a dick right (laughs) that's That's right that's the basis uh, of everything the game's meant to be played for fun and you can be competitive in that and i think that's important but you got to hold true to that that just like central core of like do unto others as you would have them do unto you i guess yeah that makes sense yeah i mean <clears throat> i've got some uh some things that i think every player should do uh important stuff the first thing is like you really need your you really need to have an open mind when you come to a disagreement that you might have during the game Scores are different. You're, you're, you know, you're talking about <clears throat> rules or things like that. Because the person who comes to this disagreement or this impasse, who's immediately like, "No, nah, that's not how that works." No, I know that's not how that works. Like, this is the rule, is gonna immediately put the other person into their offensive positions and their defensive position, where they're just like, "No, no, 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 no." Now I'm, now I'm gonna prove to you it's wrong. But if you come to the mindset where you're like, Hey man, uh, I wasn't sure it worked like that. Do you have like the rules, or do you have any, you know, anything I could take a look at real quick? I just didn't realize. Like your opponent is not going to think that you're trying to basically call them out on something, and it's just going to make the mood much better. That's definitely like one of my biggest things with people. Is like that's how fights start, right? You you think something works like this, and you immediately are like, that's not how that works, and they're like, whoa, whoa, uh, I'm pretty sure that's how that works, and then immediately they're already off put by what you've said and they feel like you're kind of calling them a cheater man and that just makes for a rough go at things even if it ends up being that you were wrong or that the other person was wrong they just feel like they were being um you know just yeah and that's just not a good feeling to have when you're a new player or you're going into something and you just don't understand like and you might just not understand how the rule works or maybe there's an faq that you didn't know about that completely affects that or a different faq or maybe the designer commentary there's a hundred different things that that it could be that could change that game state for you but just having that open mind about it is just going to make that conversation a hundred times easier so that's the first thing the second thing man is write down the score have some way oh my god yeah to tell your opponent this is what the score's at and check with them at the end of every turn all right guys we're scoring this together the worst thing that's ever happened to somebody is you get to the end of the game and it's happened um to i've, I've played people before it's definitely happened all right man we get to the end of the game i have you scored at 22 i have me scored at uh i have me scored at 26 no nah, that can't be right i was beating you the whole game Okay, um, well, I'm ready to go over some, um, you know, uh, where the score kind of is different. What do you got on your paper? Oh, I mean, I didn't score it. I just I just had you score it. Uh, what? 
Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I figured you'd get it right, but obviously not. So we're going to have to go back and kind of talk turn by turn. No, I don't think so. Uh, that's, and then we get in these crazy arguments, and it's just not worth it. Like just, just, just a small, you know, minute, two minutes every round. Just talk to your opponents. So you know what's going on. You know, it also helps you for your last turn. It helps you during the game kind of see perspective. You know, if you're going to get upset because you think you're um, getting cheated. Yeah, uh, not that you're getting cheated, but like if it's a tight game because you think it's tight and then like you just ask your opponent like, hey, man, what's the score? Be like, well, right now the score is like 26 to 15. That's not a close score. So instead of me getting super, super serious and super aggressive and kind of like trying to play, you know, I want to get this score as close as possible. Like I can kind of take a little pressure off of myself because I'm like, it's not really close and it's not going to be close. So I might, you know, just take it easy, enjoy myself. This is a game I'm going to lose. And I'm not saying I'm just going to immediately lose the game, but it, it, it definitely relieves some stress. You know, if you got a game that's like 22 to 21, uh, then I, you know, I should probably make sure that everything is 100% correct and I should be taking the time to make sure that all my moves are right. But if we're, playing a game and like i said the score is super far off there's no reason for you to be like defensive yeah crazy serious about like every move or like you know take backs and things like that that's where that sportsmanship comes in you try not to be a dick about stuff well you can kind of ease off on it when you know like hey i'm not gonna win this game or you know he's not gonna win this game so i can probably let some stuff slide that happens often too when you feel like you're winning by a lot and you look at the score and you're like, there's no way this guy's coming back. Oh, it's turn three. I forgot to bring my reserves in. That's all right, man. Just take care of it. No, dude, I couldn't do that. Yeah, yeah, dude, it's fine. Not a big deal. Stuff like that is going to stay with your opponent and it's going to make your opponent feel better, even though they're getting like, even though they're losing, you know, they're just going to feel like you, you know, are not in it just for the, I need to get as many points as possible. And I don't really care about your feelings type deal. So those are my two big things that I think a lot of players, when they first start out, like overlook, um, which, yeah, which causes a lot of problems. Some people are like that though, right? Like people forget that when you come to these tournaments, it's as if you're going to like playing like a football game, a rugby match or like a basketball game. Like you're in like a position where sportsmanship conduct is expected, you know? And I feel like that gets sometimes lost in the mix with a couple people out there, you know? I mean, like you guys said before, or like TJ and Sean just said, just don't be a dick to the other player. But some people just, whether it's they're just being stupid or they're being totally ignorant to the fact that the other person in front of them is also trying to also just have fun, but it is really a tournament and sportsmanship player conduct is really like supposed to be held in high regard yeah and some parts of the game i mean i understand that even in a tournament it's about who makes the least mistakes but there's some things that i pretty much let slide all the time i'm never going to be like you forgot your reserves you can't bring them in i'm going to remind them to bring in their reserves turn three because i'd want the same thing to happen to me i mean i had a tournament at adepticon a couple years ago where i forgot we were actually on stream i forgot to bring my last squad in and he told me I couldn't. And I was like, well, that's, you're totally, you're total right. But you know, it feels bad both ways. I think in, in that regard, uh, ETC or WTC as it is now last year instituted that both players are responsible for must have things. So like reserves must happen. So both players were responsible to remind each other that that was the case. Uh, that tournament itself is very gentlemanly like that. There's a lot of stricter rules and judging, and if if you try to use the rules against your opponent in that scenario, they they do rule against you at that oh, event. Yeah. Which is it, it's it's very cool. It's very it's it's not laid back. It's still very like the highest level of competition, but there's certain things that are musts, and you just they just force you to do them for both players to make sure that the game, you know, is, is as close to a natural as possible. They're not going to, and if somebody forgets their psychic powers and they're already in their shooting phase, I, I mean, I usually just let it slide. It doesn't, it's not, it's not, they were going to cast the psychic powers. I can't go, Oh, 
I guess I lucked out there. He forgot his seven smites. Uh, <laughs> he has a winning. <laughs> um, where I where I draw the line a little bit is if it's like the fourth or fifth time, you know, third or fourth time, depending depending on how who they are, what's going on. If I've reminded them like four or five a bunch of times throughout the game to do something, and then they just start forgetting, I'm like. Man, I I can't I can't play the game for you. Yeah. But uh, again, it's a sliding scale, for sure. Because if you're playing someone new, this the scales is broader, uh, and I think that's for everything. I mean, I try myself to to not need that kind of take backs and whatever, but it happens. We we all get tired. We all play in a game. And um, at LVO this past year, when I was playing Richard we were fireballing our first couple turns, not really doing much. And I told him, I was like, Richard, when we get to turn three, remind me, cause I'm going to forget that we're already on turn three. Cause we got to turn three in the first, like 18 minutes of the game. <laughs> wow. And I was, I was like, <laughs> um, cause we weren't doing, we were like not moving models. We were not very much like we were, he was rolling like nine dice a turn for the first three turns. I rolled like a couple dice turn one and then stopped rolling dice. Uh, and so I asked him to remind me and then I was in like my shooting phase of turn three and I realized it. I was like, Rich, I told you to remind me. And he was like, oh yeah, I know. I totally forgot to. <laughs> that we're on this turn. So, um, so I brought my reserves in, but it's, it's that kind of stuff. It's, it's a lot of the game is just, again, that social interaction between you and your opponent when you when you're trying to do something especially if it's something weird or you're trying to set up something very intricate talk it out with your opponent be like i'm trying to line up these three guys so they're in range of this character and he becomes the closest model with for their guns the rest of the squad can't they're going to be here here and here show them the tape measure real quick this is all in your movement phase right now when you get to the shooting phase there's no discussion. You've already had that discussion. There's no argument like, no, let me get the micrometer out and <laughs> tell you that you can't shoot the character because you, you've set it up ahead of time. You've been proactive in the game. And I think that's the most important thing for, for new players is to be proactive. And your battle plan isn't sneaky. You're not, everybody, you know, the models are on the table that you can't, they're not invisible. You can't just like sneak up. You're going to, you may have some cool tr tricks you pull in a game, but for the most part, you're gonna when it's your turn, you're gonna be bricking out those tricks that turn, and, and it's not like your opponent can stop you. So you might as well tell them what you're trying to do, what you're trying to accomplish, and that will alleviate a lot of problems that happen, like when the trick is pulled, or when when the move is pulled to, in the shooting or assault phase. If you talk it out as you go in the turn, it it really just opens that up. Yes. Yeah. I really agree with that. Uh, great communication in, during, before, and after a game is paramount. For example, TJ's example of the scoring being an issue at times, that can be alleviated if, say, prior to the game, you agree, we're going to put the score sheet here, we're going to do it together at the end of every round, and sign off every single round. You sit, you don't have to initial it if you don't want to, obviously, but you could honestly make that quick agreement. Hey, every round, let's take 30 seconds, Hold more, score more, kill more, whatever it is. And you quickly get that done. I think it comes down to communication between both players and having open lines of that the entire game through, which also a lot in my games where when I'm playing my movement phase, I'll literally tell them what I'm going to pre-measure, where I'm putting my models, what the distance is from X to Y to Z, and what I'm prioritizing shooting. So I'm like, all right, this model's at 34 point, or just within 36 inches. This one's at this, this one's at this. So if this guy kills this model, he's going to go here and he's going to go here. So these are the pre-measurements I made just so you're aware during my phase of shooting that these are the intentions I made with each one. So I'm just within 36. So maybe during the shooting phase, somebody knocks a table and a, and a tank gets knocked off its base or a couple of models get hit by accident, but models get put back. If that ever happens, I've already made the intent clear. This is everything's distance. This is everything's target. This is how it'll go. And there's not going to be that issue ever of something getting knocked over unless obviously he reneges on that or he or she reneges on that. Um, another thing, obviously, would be setting the tone early in the game of, because uh, some people will want to play the game of, if you move on past the psychic phase and forget a power, because say they really want to win this tournament. And it's not about imposing your um, preferences on the other person. It's just making sure you both meet in the middle somewhere and agree to whatever you're going to do throughout the game. Because I I'm 
Sean, TJ, and I are all the same way that we speak about the intent of our plays. We're not going to have someone screw themselves over by forgetting just one minor power, one movement. So having that upfront conversation of how they want to play the game and how they prefer to play the game, I think is important because you don't want to end up in the position where I'm a, you're a lackadaisical player and you're like, oh shit, I forgot my reserves at top of two, top of two, and you already started or you already started shooting or psychic phase and you say oh i wanted to bring them in the opposing player may not be of the same mind so i think it's good to measure the expectations of both players and find a happy medium because you can't just assume they're both going to be um happy to meet the lack of days goal oh shit we forgot something turn three let's bring it in maybe it's incorrect but if you forget theoretically your unit is destroyed they should have came in but it's possible it could get ruled against you so I think setting the tone early and having good communication can prevent a lot of those issues, which echoes the sentiment of TJ and Sean for the most part. I don't want to go any further on this, but really good communication, setting the tone and managing expectations throughout the game will really alleviate a lot of pain that you may get from not speaking. They end up in arguments, and we've all been there before. Mr. Courtesy for you. Again, really? Yes. <laughs> I can help it. I, I can. The, the courtesy clause that'll, that'll, that'll be important in all tournaments. <laughs> oh my god. Well, I'm sure that helped a lot of. <laughs> that's, that's my new favorite joke. I made it. On, I made it on a show last week too. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> um, keeping with the you know communication and factors like that. So uh, I get this question a lot when you know pre tournaments or people are at the store preparing for the tournament that are new players. Um, when do they, when should they really call a TO over? I know this sounds like it seems like a easy kind of question to answer, but realizing this is a social type of game and most people are kind of introverted in their own ways, you know, when is a good time to call a TO over? I think, because I've, I've been on both sides of this, right? I've TO'd a bunch of events at Mythicos along with some of the Battle for Salvation events as well, including their big team event. You, if I'm a judge at an event, call me over whenever you want. You have a question, you know, you're new, you don't know what's going on. You're like, how do I do this thing I want to do? Or uh, I feel uncomfortable. I think the most, the at the basis, the second you feel like uncomfortable in the situation, right? Where your opponent's telling you and you're like, I don't feel like that's right. You could be completely wrong. You, you know, you're, you're a newer player. Maybe you don't understand. The other opponent is very confident in what they're saying, but... That doesn't mean it, anything. If you're uncomfortable, that's what the TO is there to do, to mediate, to uh, look at the situation and, you know, come up with an answer or a solution. That solution sometimes isn't always right. It just might be the most expedient. But most of the times, you know, uh, most TOs at events have some knowledge and they're able to give you a fair ruling. And, you know, whether that ruling is right or not, at, at least it gives you something that's mediated by a third party. And that's what they're there for, to, to make sure that everything runs smoothly and people have a good time and nobody just gets railroaded. But so you should never feel like it's wrong to call a TO at all. Um, I mean, I have seen people call a TO unnecessarily and too much. That's the other side of it. But that's totally a different issue. That's that's a player that's, you know, maybe a problem player themselves. But if you if you are new then and that's it like just call them whenever you feel like a like un, you feel that uncomfortableness that if your opponent can't show you in a clear concise way because the first step should always be that you and your opponent should be able to like pull up the rule and show it and if reading that rule or being shown that rule doesn't answer your question and you f- that start to feel uncomfortable that's when you reach out for a to it's really quick in most game stores they're like 10 feet away they come over they take a look at it real quick, they make an answer, and you get right back to your game. No problem. Um, I always tell my opponents if they start to feel uncomfortable with something, I'm like, oh, do you want to call a TO? I mean, most of the time if I, if I offer that, I'm reasonably confident that the TO is going to come over and I'm going to be right. But I, I have no problem with with my opponent calling a TO at all. Sean, I'm of the exact same mind in all honesty that if you're ever uncomfortable, mainly for new players or any player, in all honesty, if you don't feel that this is right in any manner and you can't quickly resolve it by pulling up the rule or if it's a judgment issue, call the TO. Because it, the best thing, 
you don't want to sit there going back and forth on a ruling for five minutes, 10 minutes, even three or four minutes, because every minute is precious in these tournaments, especially if you're doing chess clock. So sentiment regarding calling TOs. And I would never feel guilty because you don't want to ever have a sour taste in someone's mouth because they feel like they got cheated. So agree in that regard. Um, even if you're an experienced player, um, a great thing to do is if the person across from you, let's say you know the rule 99%, you, you're about you're 99% sure, but this guy's really skeptical because maybe he's never played your army or he's a newer guy or maybe he's a competitive guy and he doesn't feel like played or maybe a, he did, a new rule popped up that he missed. It's much better for it to come from a third party telling him rather than you jamming it down his throat, reading him the rule 13 times in a row more loudly and more angrily over and over again. So I think call in TOs, especially when issue, they're always when issues arise. I mean, it's just another tool, right? It's literally a tool to assist in the game. It's to make the game easier. So my general rule of thumb for playing against people, uh, especially new players, is like, if I have, if there's a rule and he looks like he's perplexed, or you can tell that it's obviously like a break in his normal play, like he's either standing there or he's kind of looking at the board weird, or he kind of looks like he has a question on his mind, I just get a T.O., takes two seconds hey man i just uh i'm just asking about this rule that says that he can't target this model can you explain this rule real quick yeah sure no problem two seconds and then the guy's like oh that is how that works and then nine times out of ten if you're playing a you know uh a, you know a, a player who plays often you know uh they'll they'll tell you hey does that change your mind at all is there something that you, do you want to do something else? Not knowing that, you know, I'm very open with my opponent and I'm, I'm not going to let, you know, something that he didn't know cause him to lose a game. You know, uh, I want him to feel like he did everything he could to win that game. And I did everything I could to win the game. You know, it's all on the table. Then the second time, which is when I have to call a judge, which doesn't really happen often, but if you have to show me seven rules to make this one thing work, chances are, Something's going on where it's like, well, you do this and then this is in this book and then this FAQ kind of talks about it like this. But then this FAQ, no, 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 man. just give me a judge. It takes me two seconds. Even if, you know, it, it's going to be ruled out of my favor, I would just like to know it's just so we can go back to stuff. I don't have to check six books to get a rule so that we can play the game. You know, that's that's not fun for anybody. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just going to want to know. I'm a very inquisitive person by nature. If something happened to me that – um well, doesn't normally happen to me. I want to know so that I don't do that again. So that's an easy fix for me. Um, and I think a lot of the top players are like that, where they're like, I want to know where I messed up. I want to know how to fix that in the future. You know, no one's like, oh, it happened, and that's 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 it. I'm just not going to think about it anymore. Most top players are people who are always challenging the game. And they always want to be challenged. So they're very much like, I want to know how that works, why that works like that, so that I can either, that's awesome, and I want to use that in my list, or I don't want that to happen to me again, and I want to know how to stop that, So, or I want to know how it works so I can prevent that. So I think those are really important. You know, If you think you need to get a judge, those would be why I would get a judge, so... Yeah, I think that's those are all good points on that one. You know, t calling T over for anything is always usually pretty good for just for both players. I feel like just like Sean and you guys were saying, you know, having that third party kind of just make a ruling, whether it's the right one or the wrong one. You know, having it be from someone else rather than the players really is kind of like it makes the field a little bit more easy to play on. You know, um, going to like T O situations and stuff like that. You know. How fast, like for a new player, because, you know, they might roll dice slower than most, well, seasoned players like yourselves roll dice faster. You know, how fast is too fast of dice rolling? And, you know, what if they're playing on a time clock? Like, what happens if they forget to switch over the time clock to the other opponent? You know, I've always had that question brought up to me by newer players because there are many clauses in, like, competition packets where if one player requests a time clock, both players are subjected to playing on the time clock. So a lot of them get a little bit finicky and scared and rightfully so, you know, for a newer player or even players that are even seasoned, they don't like seeing a time clock and it kind of like messes with their head a little bit. I feel like. Yeah. I mean, as far as the dice thing goes, I always try. Uh, so if I'm rolling a hit, I'll roll the hits, 
pull the misses, and then I'll stop, make eye contact with my opponent, and be like, good, um, before I pick a scoop up the dice. If it's one or two dice, it's usually pretty easy to be like, we need, th and declaring what you need to hit as you're rolling it is good. It gives your opponent, a, um, again, it goes back <clears throat> to communication. If you go, I hit a three up, do you have any negative modifiers? Just is a good way to start. Um, or if you're the opponent with the negative modifiers, you really want to step up and remind them as they're rolling that you have the negative modifiers. But it, it really should be the, the department of the person rolling the dice to ask that. But they don't always because, again, they're trying to go fast. So it's important to, again, speak up as, as the defensive player if you have those rules as they're rolling the dice. Remind, remind them, hey, you're negative one to hit me. And they'll go, okay, cool. What do you normally hit on? Threes? Okay, now it's fours. And then you can watch the dice a little bit better. They should always pause before scooping the dice. Um, doesn't take a long pause to spot the couple erroneous dice that may, may may filter in. It's usually pretty quick. That's why I always I like dice that are easy to read a lot. Sometimes some some of these crazy <laughs> dice, uh, dice like those darn Nurgle dice that GW made. Those Ugh, like plastic fuck those things with like, the <laughs> bubbles. Like, yeah, those the... don't get on the table. If I see you take them out, I'm like, that's yeah, yeah. either that's no, that's no. not they're not getting played. Okay. Just, just so we're clear. I can't read those. Yeah, that those dice can't be can't be used um, at all. What do you think about the time clock situation, Sean? Uh, time clocks, they are not as scary as you think. I mean, the the, the, mo the important thing about a time clock is it is supposed to make the time fair, right? Because we've all played games of Warhammer 40k where you in a tournament where it's two and a half hour rounds, three hour rounds, whatever it is, and you've only played two turns, that's not a real game of 40k. Win, win or lose, that's not a real game of 40k. Uh, we've all done it, but the time clock at least makes it fair. Uh, I would say to players that request it, right, where like in the ITC packet, a lot of times if one player wants it, you play with it. And they become more normalized. People are, As people go to tournaments, they use them more. We actually at our uh, used to be my local store, uh, the Portal. Uh, we they started using time clocks even at their RTTs for the whole tournament. And what they found was that at the first time we did it and we just pulled it on the players, they were, they were like, "This is scary," but you know, lunchtime happens on time, the awards happen on time. So for even for small events, it's helpful because you don't have those two players in the corner ignoring the TO, playing through lunch and holding up the rest of the rounds. Uh, it was because we all know with a local tournament, you know, it's you've told your your wife, your family that you're you're gonna be gone for, you'll be home at six, but then the tournament doesn't get done until eight nine, and you don't <laughs> get home, you, you know, until later. That's that's all important. Uh, yes, we want to play, but a part of a tournament is playing within the confines of the tournament, which is time, and chess clocks do a lot to make that better for events. I don't. I don't propose or think chess clocks are necessary for hanging out with your buddies and playing 40k. That's that's not what they're there for. They're they're strictly for events, and they make that a little bit more fair. That said, I try very hard when I'm playing on a chess clock, and especially with somebody who hasn't used it, I try to click it for both people to just keep it going correctly as much as possible. Like you know, you can't be perfect. It's it's very important as the the player using the clocks to remember that you do need to click over when your opponent clicks to you. But if both players are very on top of it in terms of being willing to click both ways and help each other, it'll usually work itself out. Yeah, I can't agree more with that. You know, people always forget, I feel like, not always, but more often than not, when I'm at the store and I'm doing an event, People always forget to switch off to the other players, and I always have to remind them, like, you guys have to, rem like, it's not my job to, you know, click the clock for you guys. But when I go over there, I always make sure to pause the clock, because I'm always like, guys, like, we're going to go into either a rules question, or there's some questions that need to be answered, you're going to lose some time. So I usually always pause the clock for them, or they're usually ones to pause the clock when they, when I come over. But usually, you know, you should always try and, like, switch back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a fairness thing, and it also it teaches you to to play multiple turns and understand because a couple times if you only play two turns, your opponent gets four or five turns because they they're better using their time. You're gonna quickly realize that you might be doing things 
that are slowing the game down. Versus with no clocks, you you, you both play two turns. You know, the one guy is very dissatisfied. You know, you might be the newer player, and it, and it comes down to you come to a tournament. You want to play multiple turns. You want to use your rules. You're going to make mistakes. Don't be afraid of those mistakes. That's okay. That's that's what competition is, right? You're going to see those mistakes in real time. But if you only play two turns, you're not even really you're not even getting a feel for the game and getting better. Because if you spend your whole time looking up everything, every stratagem you could use in your rule book, uh, thinking about what what all these things are, you're not really like getting that flow of play. Being forced to play more turns, move your models more often, and see the ramifications of oh no, we got too aggressive and we all died, and then the next game you're like, oh, you can learn from that and apply that. Versus if you only play two turns, you won't learn anything to apply to the next game. Yeah, I mean we've all had that game, right? That game that. You're like, oh man, I can't wait to play this. It's gonna be awesome. And then you get two turns in, and you're like, how was the game? You know, your friend comes over, asks you how it was afterwards, and you're like, what game? I'm like, you just sat there for three hours. I'm like, yeah, we got two turns in. You know, and you've been to events that don't have chess clock restrictions, where you're like, you know, I told him to speed up, and uh, we just, uh, yeah, it just didn't didn't go well. So we just kind of, you know. We just had to do what we had to do. So I'm very fast with my opponents, which is kind of interesting. Um, you know, and I think a lot of pros are like this too, where like people will, they see you playing like, you know, 60 play bears or something like that. They're like, oh, I'm going to chess clock you. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then we get to turn five and I'm like, okay, so I have 40 minutes left. You have 20 minutes left. Um, I told you I was fast, but I mean, you know, like the players who play this on a regular basis and go to tournaments, like, like, you know, Sean said, this is what they, they, they look at this stuff. They're here to improve on this stuff. You know, the, the, the top players, the ones that are really good at the game, they're not the ones that are trying to um, cheat the system by being that quicker, you know, by, by taking their time so that you guys run out of time or, you know, taking long turns. However, though, it is just a nice little thing for you to go like, huh, my turn one took 25 minutes but my turn two took 40 minutes. So maybe I need to speed up my turn two. Maybe that, you know, somewhere I can identify problems. You know, I feel like 40K is a game where you're just trying to get better. You're trying to just learn together and be more experienced. So, like, that's something to look at. It's just another piece to look at. Yeah, I want to make it enjoyable for my opponent. Use, I want to make sure we get six turns in, you know. I want him to make sure. Whole brain, right? You can have the perfect turn every turn, right? Yeah. It would take you an hour each turn, and then the game would take six hours. But yeah, you could sit there and find the perfect set of moves each turn. But that's not what the game's about. The game is about, you know, playing, like motion. You know, make it exciting, making a narrative. You can't make a narrative if you spend all your time thinking. Yeah, I mean, you, you could move every character it. two inches. You could move <laughs> every grot an inch. Because you, you should be like, I, I should move these guys. They're just sitting on the board. Do they need to be moved? No. Did that waste 10, 15 minutes of your time? Yeah. Did it really improve the game at all? No. So, like, that's one of the parts of the game is, like, you need to understand where you need to spend your time or where your focus should be because those are the important parts of the game. And I feel like that just makes you a better player when you figure out exactly what that looks like. Yeah, before LVO and Studio Chat Chess Clocks, this was a few years ago, I actually played a two-turn game in round six. What? And... You know, it was so depressing. And my opponent forgot which one of us had top and which one of us had bottom. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> yeah. Write things and, down, boys and girls. <laughs> oh, no, no, that was the best. It's like a judge came over and said, where, where are you guys? And I was like, and my opponent said, top of two. And then the judge said, who just went? And they said they did. And then the judge was like, well, the time is the time the round is out of time i'll give you sean i'll give you four minutes to play your turn and i said well i don't need four minutes because i had bottom oh or, because no because i had top this was just the bottom of two so you'd have to give us a whole new turn which is unnecessary because i'm winning 
and, and then my opponent checked the score sheet, found out that was true, and the game ended. But it was it was not a satisfying game, and it was amazing that we could play two turns in three hours. And yeah, it was just it was one of those situations where that's that's what chess clocks are for. Um, and I you know I've played that opponent now with chess clocks a couple times and we've had full games and they've been totally fine and that's great like it's perfect like, but you know it, it's again it's a, it's a situation where like if a person overthinks things too much with if they're in a if the constraints of the, the tournament means that there's no individual time scoring on that they'll spend the time to make their moves perfect and then the game will just bog down too much but we want six turns so that's where chess clocks become important in tournaments and not that every game needs a chess clock either if if you're starting a game you're both fast you might not need it kurt doesn't like kurt and brad chester sometimes don't don't use chess clocks or don't really pay attention to it but if the game starts to bog and you're like we've spent we're on turn two and there's now an hour left then that's maybe where you you call a judge and you go hey we're going really slowly, I think. Can we split the remaining time? I didn't think a chess clock was necessary because I don't usually use one, and I'm usually very fast, but for whatever reason, either me or my opponent, we're, we're overthinking this. Can we split the remaining time? And th that's a some, somewhat happy medium to it, to at least use, use the tool to overcome an uh, issue that's in the game. Go back to the initial question. I know I'm not backtracking a little bit because you guys went far in the chess clock game but in regard to fast dice uh, i think sean gave a really good synopsis at the beginning really saying that when you're rolling give as much guidance as needed to your opponent there's no amount that's too fast or too slow it's all dependent on the person you're playing for example if you're playing with somebody you've played 100 times or x amount of times you know they're really experienced they know your army you know his army or her army you can go very fast i'm sure you both can keep up with it but making sure the other opponent is comfortable with how the speed at which you're picking up your dice is very important. Also, fast dice, I would make sure to do it in a clear area with not as many edges, not as many models, because it makes it a lot easier to pick up the dice, get them back up, rerolls. Given the amount of rerolls in the game now for hits, wounds, and saves, and feel no pains and all that stuff, keep it in a clear open area that both players can see. Don't roll stuff behind that Nova L. Don't, don't roll stuff in your corner where it's dark. Keep shit open in the middle. Make sure stuff isn't flying all over the table. Don't try to knock over too many models. By avoiding those things, you will you will speed up the, the rate at which you roll dice. I try to always, when I set up my deployment, figure out where I'm going to put my dice, put my tape measure, put my rule book, put my psychic cards, and figure out, okay, this is my main rolling area over here, and then I'll adjust my rolling area based on my movement phase. But having a good idea of how many dice also are in certain groups. I know Sean used to do this. I, I assume he spilled this now. I don't know what the numbers he uses, but he used to allocate dice in a certain I class. 30, 30, 10, and 10 in allocate three your different dice colors. To optimize your turn so that you don't have to count things out. Because say you're charging with the squad of blade bears and you're like, oh shit, how many are in melee? Are they this amount of attacks? But it's a lot easier if during your movement phase, you pre-measure, all right, if I roll, say, a five, or during the assault phase, I guess because you have to roll the charge, you have an idea of if I make this six inch charge or 10 inch charge, whatever it is, I'm going to have 10 models in, four models in, 50 models in, and make sure to have sets of dice ready to go or certain colors differentiated to speed up your game. Because these are things you can do pre-game that you don't have to figure out during the game, which will make your game easier or might free up more time because you know you don't have to worry about counting dice and also grouping dice. And also, or telling your opponent, hey, all these red ones are X, all these, these are these, and give them an idea fast dice you can improve those skills prior to the game with planning and that's not about how good of a player you are that's just optimizing your army and what you brought to the actual tournament so everybody can do this it's i think it's a great thing to follow sean's uh template and rule i'm sure of hundreds of thousands or hundreds of thousands many players have done this before where you have preset numbers of dice you use for certain units certain assault certain shooting phases because it speeds up your game and makes you have to worry less about that chess clocks uh, i think sean and TJ covered a lot of stuff, but I'll just say it's on the onus of each player to change the clock. But it does get very scary at the end of the game, say it's turn six, and you both have four and a half minutes left or five minutes left. And let's let's say that I'm shooting this, but not lookout series, but whatever the Tau drone thing is, save your protocols. And then I shoot my thing, I roll the wound. He has to decide now, does he save your protocol or do it? 
I have to hit it back to him, and now he has to make the decision. It can get a little hairy during that time. So it's on the onus of the player who's making the decision and the actionable player to do those changes. And that does get hairy. Um, I've had it happen before where it was at that Atlanta tournament. I forget the name of it. Um, one, if I'm not mistaken, the name of it. And we got to the end of the game, and we were both playing a great game. It was very close. But at the end of the game, because he – um, had so many of those roles to make, and I had so much shooting to make, and we had we went full six turns. Time on his clock. We had judges watching, but the thing is, I knew that he wasn't jumping back to the clock every time because I was managing the clock about ninety-five percent of the time, and I knew that there were times when I forgot to switch it back to him and times back to me. So at the end of the game, I was never going to be like, "Hey, you're out of time," because I probably should have. Um, if I did, I may have won the game, but game because I didn't hold it true to that clock. But the thing is, he wasn't um, tight attention to it. So to it, um, I think you have to make sure that each person is aware of the clock. I think Sean's idea of splitting the clock, if you haven't done one, is great. But obviously, you can, you can not that you can game it, but people have, can obviously take advantage of that. Because let's say you're an army that's going to get tabled in six turns, but you're going to win the early rounds by holding all the objectives. Let's say you play a slow first two rounds and you each only have 20 minutes and you know you can't get four turns done in 20 minutes. It's possible that you might just win the game because of that. So the clocks, they should assist you assuming you manage the clock correctly. Goes back to not being a dick, right? You know? I mean, yeah. I mean, it's a yes and no. I mean, you shouldn't just allow the person to go over their clock by a large period of time, but therefore... Um, there's a difference between gross misuse of it and just forgetting at one time. Um, I, I know the last RTT I was at Mythicos, uh, we played the whole, I think we the first turn we both played it correctly, and then he played his whole second turn on my clock, but it didn't matter because we both were like, eh, whatever. We know we're going to get to the game. None of us are going to call each other on it. So we spent, mine was at like 20 minutes, his at like 58 minutes. It's like, oh, all right, because we both did both of our second turns on my clock. But it didn't matter because we both kind of had a good tone of the game and understood and that's just completely erroneous. So it goes back to good communication and setting the tone for me at least. But the clock use is something you do need to get used to because it's going to be a part of the game. It appears to be more popular and it is a good tool to monitor your own play, which TJ brought up saying there are certain things you do during the game that might not be as important as other things. Shuffling your cultists on the back line that you already pre-measured so nothing could deep strike behind you is a waste of time. There are certain things like that that you should avoid in your game to prevent wasting time long run. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. It just like you said, it goes back to the communication and setting the tone in like the beginning of the game. Really important factor again is communication. It is a social game and like Sean said, and we all know that. Um, so what happens if you as a new player or in general, if you're gonna get if you like you're pretty much going to get tabled. Let's just say that this guy still has 50% of his army, or him or her rather, um, and you have like maybe a little under a quarter of your army left, just a couple of models. Do you play it out? Do you give up? Because obviously we all know, at least all of us here, know that when you give up, you can see it's it's concession, and then pretty much you, if you give up, you lose all your po not all your points, but you stop scoring, and your opponent starts to score pretty much everything. What are your thoughts and like what do you what do you guys want to kind of inform all our new players new listeners about when it comes to that? Did they did they, they change the concession rules in yep. RTC? In yep, you used to it? yeah, it, it used, used to, to be able to give you a zero. Yep, that's correct. And now you're able to keep all the points that you have occurred up to the point that you've conceded at and your opponent it's that that part hasn't changed. But then your opponent can play out the rest of the game. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Yep. Yeah, that that was a great change cuz we all had a big problem with the old rules because I can guarantee you that games ending concessions and my opponents never got a zero because everyone knew that that was a trash rule. Absolutely. And so we would just, at that point, I was never one. I, th I, I don't concede until as late in the game as possible. Like the last turn, a minute on the clock, I know I can't do anything. That's 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 the type of player I am. I'm always going to play it all the way through. At the same time, I don't have a problem with the opponent being over the game, being feeling like, hey, man, you really took it to me those first three turns. 
I'd rather, you know, go sit down for half an hour, have have a drink, relax for a minute, get my zen back before I play again. There's no sense in me continuing to play. It's it's all in like what you want and what you have. I'm I'm never gonna if I know the game is over, but my opponent continues to want to play it, that's not a problem. We're gonna play it if they feel like they want to learn some more, they want to hang out some more, they just want to roll some dice, they got they want to do something cool. There's nothing wrong with that. You you deserve to play your full game if that's what you want. Um, absolutely, you don't have to concede. There's no bad side of that. It's it's. I I would advise to not concede as often as possible, and you know, learn as much as you can. See what what you can do when the chips are way down. What what you can pull out. That kind of thing, but there's no problem with with concessions as well. Yeah, I think that, like, most players should pretty much, like, I feel, should play out to the best of their ability. And, you know, if they need to call it, it's on them to decide when they want to call it. You know, again, it goes back to communication to kind of like the beginning of the game, but also the other your opponent not kind of being that mean type of person to just keep, like, bashing it in you, like, every time you're making a poor roll or poor decision, obviously. But I feel like for me, uh, my first time over at the BFS team tournament, um, I played. I had the pleasure of playing Nick Navanti in the first round, um, and he had like I was bringing this Jane Kinari list with Harlequins and stuff. Sean, I'm sure you remember this. And it was an illegal list. Yeah. It was <laughs> illegal on paper, but I switched it up to correctly. You you told me. You told me. And also. I didn't know about that till what was it, Sean? It was like the last round on day two. Said okay, because you didn't know. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> I didn't know. Um, but regardless, I had a one model. Like I only had like it was already small army against orcs, which Nick was playing, and I had maybe it was the like turn three or four, and like I had maybe six or seven models left. And Nick kept asking me. He was like, uh, he's like, do you want to concede? You know. And I, knowing back then, you know, conceding would have just given my team zero points, and I wasn't going to do that. I wasn't going to let them down like that. So I was just like, absolutely not. I'm like, I'm going to play till you just completely board wipe me. And, you know, he was totally fine with that. And, you know, I feel like he was just kind of making sure that, you know, I was kind of still in it because it is obviously kind of discouraging when you have, like, only very few models left and, like, your opponent's got a ton of models and a chunk of his army left, you know, is pretty discouraging but for me just like you said sean is you know it's really up to the player to decide but for me i'll i'll never give it up unless you know it really even if there is no hope i would like to kind of see what i can finagle around kind of see what kind of points i can get in the end kind of somewhere in the middle in, in all honesty i think for each person i mean sean kind of stated that already that each person has their own expectations of when they want to concede or when they shouldn't concede. Um, maybe if the stakes are really high, obviously not say you never concede, but there's in a team tournament, as Kenny said, probably you probably never concede because you're doing your best for your team. But let's say it's a singles tournament RTT uh, round one and it's turn four and you have one model on the board. Sure. If you want to concede, go ahead. Say you want to get an early jump on lunge, do whatever you want. It's your game. It's your time. No one's going to force you there to play the game. Um, no one's going to be like, hey, no, I want to finish this game and kill this model to, to feel better about this or feel better about myself or complete the game for that regard. I think it's really up to each individual player. Um, my most recent example, when I played TJ at the Mythicos thing, after turn one, I knew the game was over. Um, <laughs> it, was in, it was in a position where both of us understood exactly what was going to happen at the top of two. We talked through the game. I understood basically this is going to happen, this is going to happen. Unless anything crazy happened, the chance of me have, have, having more than 5 or 10 or 15 points was unrealistically low. So what we simply did was just roll out the next psychic phase. Does he get warp time off? Does he get whatever power off? Does this go off? It's like, okay, yeah, all these things go off. I'm just running the numbers. And let's say it was a major, if this is a larger tournament, let's say like a major GT or like uh, something I traveled for far away or a team event, I would have played it out to the last moment and tried to eke out every single point. But at that point, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to chill out, relax with the fiance and kind of enjoy myself, maybe get a drink or whatever it is. Did so you go to the barbecue? <laughs> Give it for lunch. I had it right before. Barbecue was great. <laughs> that place killed it. Every um, time. Never fails. 
Welcome to Mythicos. You got barbecue and 40k. It's not that bad of a, it's not a bad place. Um, so that was my most recent one. But I usually I'm of the mind never concede unless I don't know. But the vast majority of the time I never concede. But with TJ, I would say, all right, I have time. This is a little RTT, and um, I have lots of time on my hands. My fiance's here, and we both. I know exactly what he's going to do. He knows exactly how to finish this game correctly. Time and place for it, but. Obviously, certain armies are better at coming back than others. So um, it depends on your army as well. Some can really swing in the game, some can't. Depends on the way you build it. Yeah, I like uh, I like playing it out, man. Uh, I'm a big I'm a big fan of playing it out, unless it's like something crazy, like I lost half my army on turn one, which I hope doesn't happen ever to me while I'm playing <laughs> but um, I mean it you know it's possible but like I usually play out games I want to see what's going on um, but I have talked out games before uh, I played Sean actually at um, Glass City and uh, we played I think the first four turns and I was like I just need to see you do this and this if you can kill these models then we're pretty much done I mean I don't really have anything left after this but I've also played games where you know, I lost something on turn one that was like really detrimental. End up winning the game, a game that I should have lost. You know, so I mean, like, you got to know where your focal point is, and you got to know where, like, what part of your army is a point of no return. I think for a lot of people, you know, I'm not saying that it's bad that people are like, I want you to kill every model in my army before I give it up, like. <laughs> that's fine that kind of mentality is fine um but i feel like there's something going on with you that you needed to see that because like it's like uh it's like watching a car accident happen i feel like in that in that instance like you're like i know it's happening and i know it's really bad but like i just want to see it like i want to see what happens i can't look away so like um like with me I have like key components in my army. If I lose these key components, um, all of these key components, there's nothing I can do. I mean, there's not like it, it, it's at that point, it's it's numbers. I can't I can't come back from a deficit like that. But that's not always the case. So I mean, like, and it's different for everybody. Like some people will, like, uh, if you're playing a list with Magnus, right? Your Magnus dies on turn one, and your opponent's like, okay, GG. You're like, well. In your head, you're like, no, that's fine. I actually, I knew he was gonna die on turn one. Like, I'm not, I didn't go first. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna. He's not gonna live no matter what I do. But that's not a losing point for you. However, if on turn one you lost Armin and two Demon Princes, uh, that's probably, <laughs> um, that's probably game right there. Um, but I probably still wouldn't give it up until like magnus died magnus dies my demon princess die and armin dies well I, I got nothing man that's it so i think it's just different for everybody like when i played against kurt like yeah kurt could have played another turn we could have gone another turn where i killed even more of his army and he could have shot me back maybe killed a couple of models there was just no like he had a lot of stuff on the table left alive i mean he still had three flyers uh he had uh, two night spinners, um, and he had two fire prisms. Did any of that stuff really matter? Not really. I mean, the, the, the stuff happened. I was already up in his face, and, like, he was going to lose so much on the next turn. We didn't really need to see it. I mean, once I... And he made me roll warp time. We rolled warp time. They moved, like, 20 inches, and I was like, well, they're now they're right here. They can go literally wherever they want. So, I mean, like, they just didn't need to see it at that point. But uh, like I said, it's just different for everybody. Just don't pressure people into giving it up. That's that's a that's a common thing that like will piss somebody off really quickly. And then maybe they were gonna surrender, but now they're definitely not gonna surrender. And now you're gonna have to play the whole game. And you were just trying to be nice, you know? Like, hey man, I want to spare you from another hour of me just grinding your army to a pulp. But the way you said it or the like the fact that you said it to them just upsets them so um that's definitely something to consider as well i think that's a um a common mistake that pro players make against like new players 
or people who aren't as experienced to be like, okay, so you want to call it? No, I don't want to call it. Like, and then they're upset that you would even bring it up. Like, let someone tell you that they're done. Like, you know, Kurt's a top player. I would never have said to him like, well, that's the GG. You want to just <laughs> give it a, give it a go. But like Kurt made the decision on his own. Like, Hey, you know what? I, I think we're good. And I was like, okay, Hey, that's totally fine, man. You know? Um, and uh, I guess the only other thing I would say is like with, in regards to that is like, don't force your opponent to play more turns too. like, just cause you want more points. Like that's just, they're already upset at themselves that they're giving it up. Now, if it's like turn one and they're like, okay, cool. You get a 32 out of 42. Like, well, dude, you're conceding and it's turn one. Like, I feel like we're done. Like, like I'm obviously going to get more points than 32. Um, but like, if it's like, I could get a 42 instead of a 41, like just get, just, just call it, man. It's not worth it. And your opponent's going to feel better that you're not trying to like, Oh, it was a 42 to like a, 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 a five. Like he already feels terrible. He's not feeling good about it. And again, this is like a lot of the advice that we give on these podcasts, this, this podcast in particular is like feeling it's not like this is a hard, fast rule. Every time you play your opponent, don't try to scrape out another couple of points. Like if it's a team event, that's obviously different. But like if it's, you know, a GT round one or round two and your opponent is obviously distressed and you have played them and then we're on like turn three and he's like, okay, we're done. I'm, I'm not going to try to talk him into giving me a 41. Like that's just not what I'm going to do. I'm going to be realistic with him and – get a couple points, it's still going to be a 35 or a 36, but I'm not going to try to pressure him into giving me a 42 just because he's conceding to me. It's just not going to end well, and he's going to feel bad. And then the next time we play, it's just not going to be fun. So I want my opponent to feel like they tried, and uh, they're done. We're in a good spot, and they're just, they're okay. They're and, right they did, that. and they did something, you know? They, yeah. I know uh, we've gotten a l like gone over a bunch of topics today so far, and one of the last topics I really wanted to hit before you know we log off for the night is mulligans. I know that it's really always up to the players for mulligans, but I wanted to hear what you guys had to say on mulligans. Yes or no? What is your thoughts on them before we log out for the night? Oh, I'm a huge fan. I, that's how I play, and I feel like a lot of the top players play like that. Like, uh, you know, especially with setup and stuff like that. Like, there are literally, like, 20-plus books of rules. Do you think you're going to know every rule? Maybe if you play as often as, like, myself or maybe Nick or Sean, you might know most of the rules that matter, but whoa, whoa, I whoa. still don't know every rule. I don't play that often, GJ. Okay. <laughs> All right, well... I do. I play very, very often. But even I, like, I don't know every rule. And, like, um, nobody feels worse than somebody who gets caught on a rule that they didn't under, they didn't know because, you know, and it completely destroyed their army. So I'm the guy who, while you're playing, is like, literally anything that might affect your turn at all. I'm like, hey, man, I just want to let you know. Just so you know, if you try to charge this unit here, this one guy that no one ever takes says that you fight last. Oh, I didn't know that. Hey, man, if that changes anything, do me a favor, move whatever you want, do whatever you want. I want to beat you because I am a better player. I'm more tactical, and I outplayed your tactical plays. I don't want to beat you because you forgot a rule that caused you to lose half your army. It's just not fun for anybody. You're not going to feel, and I, I hope this is the same with every you know, top tournament player, you just feel like it wasn't a real victory hey man what happened oh i got a 40 oh yeah what what happened oh turn one he let me uh he let me jump a smash captain into his uh castellan and i killed it in one shot <laughs> oh well was he running any guard oh yeah he had like 60 guard but like i you know i had a guy behind a wall he didn't know about uh, uh <laughs> forlorn and i basically double moved that guy and i there was a gap there and i just killed him on turn one like if you would have just told that opponent uh, that opponent you had a, a guy in a building, you know this guy can move 24 inches, right? No, I didn't know that. Oh, shit. Okay, well, do you want to move anything? 
yeah, that's that's I appreciate that. Uh, you know, same thing with you know Sean. You know, if uh, Sean leaves a there's a nice juicy gap for a solitaire, and you can run up and basically just smack a couple of characters. Like Sean's gonna be like, hey man, you know that like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> can like kill half your army right uh, oh that guy right i completely forgot about your solitaire because nine times out of ten those kinds of interactions they only happen when you need it to happen so like smash captain solitaire um psychic powers like um gateway like infernal gateway targets the closest unit and then every unit within three inches so a lot of people and chaos is one of the 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 factions that can well, we can readily swap our psychic powers. So, like, people ask me all the time, like, hey, man, do you have Gateway? No, I don't. <laughs> now, I could just literally leave it right like that. Like, nope, I don't have Gateway. Cool. I'm going to stack all my shit real close to this one tank. But if I don't say to him, like, but I can swap it out for one CP, and if you do this, I'm most 100% going to swap it out. So, like... Uh, you know, like you have to, there's, there's gotta be a level there where you're just, you know, there's that, but then there's the other level where like, if this is like Sean said earlier, like if this is the fifth time that you've forgotten that the range of your, all your buffs is six inches and that guy's out of six inches for like the sixth time, I, I, I can only do so much. Like I'm like, Hey man. Oh shit, I forgot, man. I'm so sorry. I'm like, yeah, I know, but you forgot turn one, turn two, turn three, turn four. And I told you the last time, this was going to be the last time I was going to let you take it back. So I think you also need to be very clear with your intent with that stuff too. Don't just like on turn two or turn three be like, nah, man, I'll let you take it back the last two turns. I'm going to let you do that again. When you want to hit your breaking point, you got to tell the guy like, hey, man, I'm going to let you take back this. You forgot the psychic phase for the second turn in a row. I'm going to let you do the psychic phase. However, this is the last time, man. I can't, like, we got to play the game, you know, how the game is supposed to be played. So, right. like, two turns in a row, you're forgetting a psychic phase is big. So, like, I just, um, like, there's there's got to be, you know, and it's different for everybody. But for me, I'm very laid back. Like I said, I want, I want to beat someone because tactically... I just outplayed them. I don't want to beat you because you forgot a rule. And like, there are so many rules. So you really got to, I feel like, be be decent to your opponent, you know? Be good to your opponent. And your opponent will be nice to you. Tell you about stuff that will affect your game that maybe you didn't know about that could have cost you the game if you didn't do something. So, like, it goes both ways. And, like, you don't want to be on the receiving end of something, especially when the whole game you've been, like, very you know, precise with all your movements, and then something happens, and you're like, wow, I literally just lost the game because I forgot about one stupid rule. Or, like, Sean on turn two drops a whole bunch of Shining Spears on my backfield, and I'm like, oh, my God, he had he had reserves. <laughs> I completely forgot he had reserves. And then everybody just dies. So, like, stuff like that is important. It's also important to explain to your opponent what you're trying to do, like we talked about before, when this kind of stuff happens, if you know how a certain ability works. Like, Hey man, my intent here is that all these units are 3.1 inches away from this tank. Okay, cool. Now I can't gateway you. Gotcha. Makes the game quicker. I don't have to take a tape measure out and be like, well, this guy is 2.9 inches. Like, we just don't have to do that. It speeds the game up, and we both get a good feeling from the game because we feel like we played tactically, and we played to the best of our abilities, and no one tried to, like, I hate to... I know it's a, a big phrase everyone uses, the gotcha stuff, but I, I don't want to feel like uh, anybody was, you know, gotcha. taking it, yeah, gotcha, <laughs> for lack of a better term, or taken advantage of because, like, you just, you thought you did something. Like, that happens a lot, too. Like, we, like, uh, like Kurt was saying earlier, like, ranges, like, something got nicked out of range or something fell off a table, and all of a sudden your opponent's like, oh, not in range. And you're like, well, we talked about this. Like, I did say I was going to be in range. Something just must have gotten nicked one way or the other or moved. Happens all the time, you know. Um, I put magnets on the bottom of my, my models. Objectives sometimes have magnets. Sometimes things get moved. Like, so, but yeah, that's my, that's my thing. I think DJ did a great job summarizing, honestly, that a lot of scenarios and a lot of different mulligans 
And it is up to the player, obviously. He's a very forgiving player. Some people are not going to be. So I think it's smarter to go in uh, to certain tournaments under the impression that your opponent might not be forgiving. So be a little more careful and it'll be a little more transparent. I'm obviously when I get to a table and I know this guy, maybe I don't actually know him, but I can tell by the tone and the way he's sitting and the way he's setting up his models and the way he's talking about his army that there aren't going to be take backs in this game. So based on their their attitude, the way they describe their army, how much they divulge, and the way they talk about it, that they possibly might be a person who's a little more reserved with giving mulligans. Um, and in those situations, you have to be a little more careful. So it's about reading the person in front of you, and also, obviously, of course, we preach communication over and over again, but there are times, obviously, if I know this guy across me is a dick, he's known for being a dick, and maybe I want to stick it to him. I'm going to, maybe he does have fuck something up early, I'll let it go, but after that, I'm not letting anything else happen. Um, and there, maybe he calls you out on the first thing, and then you're playing in the game where every little thing you're catching. But you try to avoid those. But there are times for those moments where being a dick. Sorry, if someone's being a bad sport <laughs> and being an asshole and say he fucked over my friend two rounds ago, fuck this guy. I'm tabling him, and I'm catching him for whatever bullshit he does. Because there are times when it's like, all right, now we have to bring it out, be the bad guy. I'm sorry, but every once in a while it'll happen. Um, I hear like, oh, a good friend of mine just started the game. This guy tabled him without mercy, and he and he misplayed a rule that he forgot or something. I was like, fuck this, no. Kurt with guy no courtesy. Out. Yeah, no, there it never is. Wanna get, never want to get the Kurt with no courtesy. It's the worst. Oh, I save it for a few people. The courtesy clause. Gone, out the window. <laughs> Sean, any thoughts on the mulligan? I think I talked about it earlier, I think. You yeah, know, you know, er, early on, it's it's it is what it is, and if it's repeated offense, it, like TJ said, you let them know that hey, man, this is the last time. You can say it as a joke or whatever, but <laughs> just just undercut it. But you just put your foot down if you feel like at a certain point it's being taken advantage of, versus you know being something that is just to make the other player feel like they're doing the best that they can do. Yeah. 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 I always tell my opponents when we start, like, hey, man, I'm real laid back. If you get anything, let me know. We can go back and fix it. That's literally what I do at every tournament. I feel like a lot of people, that's that's a conversation you should definitely have at the beginning of a, any any round, no matter when, no matter who you're playing, unless, like, you're playing against someone that you play all the time because they should already know. But, like, because then, like Kurt said, you know, you'll have, you see people mannerism when they set up and stuff. They're playing They're playing serious, man. Like it's it's game time and you better not make a mistake. I've had people who tell me after I'm done with my spiel that I do to everybody, like, yeah, no take backs. I want to play super serious. You mess something up, that's how it is. And you're like, okay. It doesn't happen often, but when it does, like I wanna be I wanna know before we get into a situation where I'm super upset about it. And you know, they're like, it's completely within my um, restriction and my purview to basically tell you, no, I'm not going to let you fix that because it is always on the player. And if I don't know how my player, the, the person I'm playing against is when we start, well, that could be a problem later on. That's really going to hurt. So I want to make sure that we have the conversation and we know what's going on. So. Yeah. I can't say any better than you guys. Very important stuff. And, you know, I hope that all the new players and guys that are listening to this or people that are listening to this rather, you know, take away these couple key things that we had to talk about, like keeping score for both players. Like both of you should catch and keeping score. You know, I, you know, we touched over this, but I think that all players should go to every tournament with lists printed out so they have those physical lists so they can see those lists. You know, it makes it easier for selecting secondary objectives in ITC tournaments. Um, being proactive about what you're doing when you're like moving models, shooting models. You guys talked about that. You know, again, these are very key points for all new players and just players in general that want to like up their game. Um, and setting this one early. Again, communication is key in any of these tournaments and anything in general. You know, especially because you're this is a very social game. And if to just all your points, if you don't communicate what you're doing or at the beginning of the you know your for your first round second round whatever game it is you know if you don't clarify like your position on certain things you know it's just going to lead to a whole tumbleweed to getting bigger and bigger and snowball effect um and it's always good to call a t over you know obviously excessive 
calling a TO over you, even the TO will be like, oh my god, what now? You know, it's it should never be a problem for a TO to come over, and you should never feel afraid to call one over because, just like you guys said, you know, it's important as a newer player in general to get clarification. Having that third party clarify for even players that have been playing the game for a while kind of just equals out the playing field. And always come prepared, you know. Conceding is always up to you, you know. Being prepared to take experience with every game you go into, whether you're winning or losing, is always, always important again. Um, well, again, I hope that everyone enjoyed this podcast. And if you liked it, make sure to like and subscribe to Mythico Studios. And don't forget to check out our website, mythicos.store.com. All right. Thank you, guys. Hey, guys. Hope you enjoyed our Mythic Table Warcast. Uh, if you guys have any products you want to grab for Warhammer 40k or any awesome hobby products, our Mythico Studio store at mythicos.store.com is filled with tons of awesome products for you to grab. Thanks. Hope to see you again in the next one.